Good afternoon, family. Welcome back for another episode of Speaking Legally, where the legal meets the cultural with my guest host, Edward Pachado Esquire and Royce Russell Esquire. My name is Dr. Stacey N.C. Grant. Thank you so much for being here, for following, for engaging, for sharing the show and all of the wonderful notes that you send us telling us that you're really happy that this show exists to break down what's happening legally, especially when it deals with our culture. So we're happy because Ed is back in the United States of America. (laughs) He's been traveling the globe. We're grateful that you had safe traveling mercy there. Nobody finds these people. You are back. And since you're back, we're going to maintain that social distancing. That's why he's not in the studio with that. (laughs) And a 14 day quarantine get you going, bro. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome back. So, before we jump into the show, any fun things you want to share about your trip or just greeting the audience? Uh, it was a, it was a, it was a good trip. Um, I was able to, you know, spend a good amount of time with my children, my family. It was great. Um, I actually discovered a black patron saint in Germany named St. Maurice. Um, he was a Roman general, the Theban Legion, researched that. Let's talk about the black presence in Europe at some point, but I just wanted to drop that jewel. That was something beautiful that I encountered during my journey. Interesting. Well, that's good to know. Good to history. I'm glad to see Mo made his way out to Germany. Stay yeah, Mo. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to see it, you know. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Mr. Russell, you want to greet the audience. How's your week been? What's happening since our last show? Well, you know, a lot has happened, happened since our last show. You know, uh, constant movement, constant movement in this field, in, in this field of law. We're hoping that our Supreme Court justice holds on until we have a new president in place. Don't fail us now. Betsy, hold on. To, with all your fibers, stay right there for us. Uh, so we can have an, a new a new appointment in the Supreme Court when a new president hits hit the mark, because we know that's what's going to happen. We know November is going to be a power drive to have different faces in different places. And, um, you know, Mr. Biden, or uh, as we can say, Vice President Biden under the Obama administration is going to need all the help he can get. And uh, he's, made, he's made the right choice. You know, he's made the choice of the people. And so, um, as uh, you know, the help is given, and the, and the fight goes on, and and uh, Vice President Harris goes in on to stomp out the non-believers and the haters, <laughs> and bring on a new revolution of what we can see black faces in different places. Um, I'm I'm open arms with it. I'm open arms. And let me just say this. Nobody walks into this space clean. There's always something that you can find on somebody at any given time when it comes down to their politics, their personal, um, when it comes down to how they made it to where they are. And you don't get this far in life with just always being kind to black folks. Because that's some of the things we're going to hear. What is her record in reference to black folks? There's no way you, no way how you reach this position and everything is 100% lovely with black folks. So there's going to be some issues. There's going to be some obstacles that we're going to have to deal internally. But we know what we got to do. We got to cast that vote. And what will be interesting to see what uh, white women of America do when they're faced with another woman of power. Will it come down to skin or will it be a gender unification? What do you think, Ed? Well, you know, I actually hope this becomes a race that's based on ideas, that's based on principles, that, that's, that's based on the lining up of what people need and what people want here. 
I mean, there's no question that Kamala Harris is qualified for the job. She's been a successful uh, in everything. She's been successful in pretty much everything she has done. Like you said, Royce, not everyone is going to disagree, is going to agree point by point on exactly what she's done throughout her career and the various positions that she's occupied. However, at the end of the day, we can't deny this is a historical moment. You have the first woman of African descent, the first woman of Indian descent on a major party ticket for the top offices in the country, for vice president, which if, you know, uh, Joe Biden becomes the president and God forbid something happens to him, this system could potentially become the, the first female president of the United States and the first women, woman of African descent, Indian descent, in the most powerful seat, arguably, on the globe. So that's what we're talking about here, quite frankly. So I got to give my props to her. I wish her success. Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm certainly, you know, uh, you know, unless I hear something different throughout the campaign or something monumental happens, you know, you know, they, they're gonna, they're gonna get my vote because we definitely need a uh, drastic change um, in leadership for some various, for some very obvious reasons. And let me just add one thing. One of the things that is like underneath all of this is the fact that she's a product of a historically black college, right? And university, right? And that means a whole lot because the movement should be to empower those institutions as much as we can. And since we're talking about this movement of social justice, this movement of equity in the workplace, this movement of our lives matter too. I'll put this out there. This is not the first time that I put it out there, but I'll put it out there again. It is time for that movement to also take place in education. All of division, potential division one, African-American and Latino and people of color, football, basketball, hockey, track, lacrosse, you name it, any sport. Maybe it's time to say no to Kentucky and say yes to Howard. Maybe it's time to say no to Alabama and say yes to Grambling. Maybe it's time to say no to a place like Duke or a place like Arizona State or Illinois State or some of these other institutions. Say yes to Mega Evans or say yes to, uh, to Morgan State or say yes to Hampton or say yes to any of the other, to Shaw University, say NC State, say yes to any of these other black institutional historically black colleges, say yes to their program. You only stay in a year anyway, and you're going pro. See how much economics you can give back to that school by the TV rights, by all the pro scouts going there, by money, by the boosters going there to raise the program and see how that infiltrates and how that is, how there is a domino effect in the academics for those institutions. It's that's amazing. It's amazing. I'm sorry. That's it's amazing amazing. you mentioned that. There was recently, I believe, a highly ranked high school athlete did, who did. chose a predominantly black uh, institution, um, you know, in terms of playing their division one. So I think that, that you know, you, you may be talking about a trend in that direction, hopefully. Hopefully we, hopefully we can get a fab five, like back in the day with Chris Webber and Jackson and Jalen Rose. We can get a group of folks and they say, you know what? We go into Howard. And then what we do with that is we take assistant coaches that have been sitting on the sideline at these major universities that are African-American. And they say, you know what? I want to go back to, you know, Shaw, or I want to go back to NC State and become a coach there. And now they have a well-suited coach as well in that area to take on. Well, I, you know, that is a dream that I would like to see realized in my lifetime, if we could support our own and like you said it would bring resources it would bring advertising so many dollars but that is definitely a whole show in and of itself just talking about that but as we raise consciousness here on speaking legally it helps us to think differently and reimagine what we can do as a community so i'm going to just double that so i can do a little black girl magic shout out to our vp pick 
This is historic. I also understand she has some Jamaican roots, so I'm very excited about that. And of course, she represents one of the national black sororities. So I'll shout out to my uh, sister sorors of Alpha Kappa Alpha. It's always a wonderful thing when you can see a black woman excelling. And as a black woman, we have to continue to celebrate when we are in positions that open up doors for others. And this is the <laughs> highest position that we have been able to infiltrate to date. So to Ed's point, she could be the next sitting president, God forbid, something happens, but what a wonderful piece of history in the midst of all that we're experiencing in 2020 to have something that we can celebrate as a community where the legal meets the cultural. As you said, Mr. Russell, there could be many bones to contend with, so to speak, on her record and what she does. But at this moment, can we just all focus that it's wonderful that Joe Biden was courageous enough to pick a woman of color to be his running mate for this very historic election. So congratulations to Senator Harris. We're wishing her and uh, Vice President Biden the best as they move forward with the campaign. There's too much at stake. This is not time for us to support other ideas. I hear people talking about third parties and all that gets great. But right now, in order to get the occupant in public housing in 1600 Pennsylvania, we need to move forward with making sure that this election goes in the right direction. So that's just my personal thoughts. I can't influence uh, what you do, but I hope you make the right choice when it comes to the election. So now that we've celebrated our sister, thank you for tuning in, Danny, Richard, Isabel, we appreciate you and thank you for joining the show today. So we have some other follow-up items to talk about with what's happening in the news and some of the things that we talked about on a previous show when it comes to how we advocate for opportunity. It builds on the whole education conversation that Mr. Russell just mentioned in supporting historically black universities. But now we're talking about a black man who was going after one of the largest telecommunications companies. And there's a little bit of an update that Ed has been doing some research on and Mr. Russell has some commentary. And I think the audience was really engaged in this particular portion of our show. So we're gonna bring that back full circle with Mr. Byron Allen with settling the Comcast battle that he has had going in the news and in the court system. So over to you, Ed. Okay, so if I may, um, what I want folks to realize here basically is, is that, well, let me start out with this. You know, I just wanna let the audience know that I grew up in uh, some public housing projects. I grew up in Grant Project. What? And uh, yes, yes, it's, a, it's located in Harlem. Um, around Amsterdam Avenue between 125th and about 122nd and runs from basically uh, Broadway to Amsterdam to about uh, Morningside Avenue. But aside from all that, you know, growing up in those projects, I saw a lot of things. And one of the things that I saw sometimes is people get jumped and having to fight maybe two guys at the same time, right? And so this case, these cases reminded me of that because a lot of people are talking about Comcast, but what you got to realize here is, is that Byron Allen was basically going hand to hand with two giants. He wasn't just fighting Comcast. He was also going hand to hand with another company called Charter, which behind Comcast is the third largest TV operator in the country. Now, just to give you some background, Comcast owns Xfinity Cable, NBC, NBC Universal, Telemundo, a Universal, you know, huge media company. And then you had Charter. Charter actually bought out Tom Warner Cable. So it owned Spectrum, um, you know, whatever was under the Tom Warner umbrella. You know, it's like I said, it's the third largest paid TV operator. And so Byron Allen, for years, he was trying to get each one of these entities to pick up his uh, channels. He owns a company called Entertainment Studio Network. So he has like basically seven TV networks under that umbrella that he owns, one of them being the Weather Channel, but he owns other channels, something called Justice TV, Pet TV, just a diverse 
set of networks that have different audiences, different viewing matter. And so he goes to each of these companies, says, hey, listen, I'd like you to carry my channel. And each of them ultimately says no. Um, and in, in some cases, for instance, Charter is alleged to engage in some really naughty conduct. Uh, the top executives made some racist statements. They didn't only say no, they said hell no. And they made racist comments. It's in the complaint. I'm not saying anything that's yeah, new. Yeah, no, it's, it's and, in there. And, uh, and, you, and you know that anytime that you put a case in federal court, whether you have two defendants or one defendant, you always feel like you're getting jumped. You always feel like you're getting the beat down. And why do we feel that way? Because the courts are usually conservative. And so now, Ed, put a pin exactly where you are. Let's let's recycle some of the things in Dr. Grant that we talked about. We talked about voting. We talk about local. We talk about understanding the local and with an eye on the national. So now, Ed, you have Byron Allen bring the lawsuit in district court. You have that judge that's appointed, appointed by the president, right? Appointed by someone that maybe we didn't think would really have any influence in our life directly. But that appointment is made. Now, that conservative judge or judge with a viewpoint that's like the president is now presiding over a case like this one that relates to Byron Allen. And what do you think that judge may or may not do? What is that judge's tendencies? What is that judge's favor? Is Byron Allen going to get a fair shot? Or are you going to get what Ed said? He's going to get jumped like he's back in Grant Projects. Hey, hey, hey uh, Ed, I remember they threw a bowling ball off the roof of Grant's projects. Not only getting jumped, they were very dangerous there. Probably more dangerous than St. Mary's Project. I don't know. Oh, yeah. We have to research that. But anyway, you know, the feeling of getting jumped is not only by the people in, in places that have power, but also in the venue, being in federal court, being in a place that you know that is not welcoming to someone of color and is conservative by nature. And here he is fighting, too. So how did he do, Ed? Tell me. Who got the knockout punch? Well, you know, this is interesting because for just for background for the audience, you know, uh, what, 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 what Royce was alluding to is the trial court in the federal system is the U.S. District Court, right? So you have the U.S. District Court, and if things don't go your way on either side, if you decide to appeal a decision from the District Court, you then go to what's called the Court of Appeal, which is... Uh, <clears throat> called a circuit court. There are 13 of them around the country. Correct. And, so, and so the one in California where Byron bought his case is called the Ninth Circuit. So let me just tell you what went down. So basically there's two cases. There's Charter v. ESN, which is Entertainment Studios Network. That's Byron's company. But then while he was getting jumped, he got some help from the National Association of African American owned media. So, so, he whistled, so, he, so he whistled down the block. He's like, so the association <laughs> came and joined as a defendant. They joined as a defendant because you know they 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 represent African owned media companies. So now you know it's Byron and uh, N A A A A M against Comcast and on the other case against Charter. So, you know, he takes his case uh, to the district court and it's, 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 a, it's a bag of missed results. With the Comcast case, based on their arguments, he had to amend his complaint several times. Each time the court would say, listen, um, you're not meeting the standard. Because what we're talking about here, we're talking about two evidence standards. We're talking about but for, and we're talking about motivating factors. So what do I mean by that? Okay, what happened here was Byron is trying to get his cable TV uh, channel heard, uh, carried by these, uh, these companies. They refused. Now, in the case of Comcast, their reason was that programming demand, bandwidth, constraints, uh, preference for programming not offered by Byron's company. And, you know, when when uh, when Byron and the NAAAM sued, they were alleging a violation of what's of a statute called 40 
42 U.S.C. United States Code, Section 1981. Now, this is a civil rights statute from 1866, right. right after the Civil War. For some of those historians out there, you know, there was a civil war. It was fought. The North won, or so we thought, right? Some people years later are claiming that, you know, they shouldn't have won. I don't know what planet they're on. You know, they're carrying these crazy flags that, you know, shouldn't be up, you know, because the loser usually has to put their flag down and put it away somewhere. But anyway, only in America, as Don King would say. So, um, so Byron and the NAAA M. Sue, and what they're saying is, is that they're alleging a violation. And they're saying that this statute guarantees, quote, that all persons have the same right to make and enforce contracts as is enjoyed by white citizens, okay? Now that word make becomes more important as I talk about this case, right? So the district court dismisses Byron's complaint in the case of Comcast, because so they're saying that he failed to plausibly show that but for racial animus, Comcast would have contracted with his company that, that he, he failed to show that, but for his race, that, you know, that, that there were race neutral reasons for them to not have contracted with him. And Byron- yeah, can, I, can I ask you to stop right there, Ed, right? I okay. Just, well, just, just mark that for a second because- Mark. What, he, what I want our audience to truly understand is that, real simple, Byron Allen's a simple guy. Ed and I are simple people. Dr. Grant, we're simple people. We're saying the reason why you won't sell me the lollipop is because I'm black. And the guy behind the counter is saying, no, nah, the reason why I'm not selling you the lollipop it got nothing to do with you being black. It got to do with that. That's the last one I got. Or, you know what? Oh, I was saving it for my man Fred. Or it's cracked, and I don't really want to, I don't sell cracked lollipops. So even if, even if he wasn't black, I wouldn't have sold you the lollipop. And what Byron Allen saying, that's some bullshit. That's what Byron Allen saying, that you not telling me that lollipop because I'm black. I don't care if it's cracked. As a matter of fact, it don't look cracked. I see a whole box of lollipops behind the counter, so don't tell me it's the last one. And I know that you sold one the other day to my man Fred, but you're not selling it to me. Hey, so I know the deal, right? And so what the court is saying is that Byron proved this, prove that they're not selling you the lollipop because it's cracked or because they don't have any more in the back. And Byron is saying, how can I prove that if they got all the goodies? If they holding all the cards? If they holding all the evidence? If they holding all the documents? Or maybe there is, there's no document out there that really speaks to the fact that they're not giving Byron Allen a fair shot because he's black, because they're wise enough not to put that in writing. They're smart enough only to talk about it on the golf course or at the Lakers game. They're not going to talk about it out in public where, where we can hear it and we can build the case. And so that's where Byron Allen first got stuck. Am I correct? Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, in the Comcast case. Now, in the yeah. case of Charter, because Charter engaged in certain conduct that Byron was able to allege was much more overt in terms of the racial animus, it seems that Charter decided, you know what? What we're going to argue is, is that we have a First Amendment right not to carry those channels. We could put, you know, whatever channels we want out there to the public based on the First Amendment, you know, freedom of speech. And the district court said no. They said, you know, that, that Byron had alleged enough to continue to go forward. The problem was with that both, you know, cases are pretty much running on the same track. Um, Comcast is a, you know, after I believe three amended complaints in the Comcast case, the district court granted the motion to dismiss. Byron um, takes appeals the case to the Ninth Circuit. The charter case somehow, you know, uh, gets there as well. And what ends up happening is, is that the Ninth Circuit reverses. They said that Byron only needed to show or only needed to plead facts, okay? Now, keep this in mind. When you write a complaint, you're pleading certain, certain facts. You're saying, this is what I'm alleging happened, okay? And so, you know, at, at that stage of the lawsuit. So they said that ESN, Byron's company, had pled enough facts 
to plausibly show that race played some role in the defendant's decision, Comcast, in the decision-making process, in the decision-making process. Let's keep that in mind. And that under this standard, this evidence standard, that ESN had a viable claim, okay? So now, you know, Comcast loses. Charter had already lost at the, you know, at the uh, circuit court level and had appeal to the Ninth Circuit, right? And so he wins at the Ninth Circuit against both of his opponents. He, you know, he hit him with a, with a nice left and then he had him on the ropes for a minute, right? But then the bell rung, next round comes. Um, the Supreme Court accepts cert, okay? What's Sir Sharari? When you appeal a case from the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court doesn't have to take the case. They could decide, you know what? The Court of Appeals decided the case just fine. We don't want to get involved. But in this case, they said, no, you know what? We'll hear the case. We'll hear the case. Wait, 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 Hold on, hold on. All right, all right, all right. Hold on, Eddie Spaghetti Super up when you're ready. Hold on, hold on. Now, let me just process this. I'm processing it, right? So Byron Allen's in district court, right? So you pick your five, I pick my five. We run in the full court, I'm in district court. Referee calls a foul. That's what they did. Comcast and them called the foul. They're like, yo, get this case out of here. Huh, right? We looked at the referee said, I agree with you. Case out of here. Byron Allen says, time out, time out, time out. I want the tape review. Let's review the tape. Yeah, let's, let's review the tape. tape. They do in sports, right? Football, basketball. Let's do the replay. So they go to the desk. They do the replay. Uh-oh. Second circuit <laughs> says, looking at the replay, oh, no. The case shouldn't be dismissed. We Now we're ready to fight. Now we're ready to rock and roll. So now Byron Allen says, call reverse. I'm ready to rock and roll. And the circuit sec, sec, second circuit says, he no, only, circuit. Uh, excuse me, ninth circuit says that he only has to allege facts. And, and let's let's really dive dive hard on that. He only has to allege facts. That's different than he has to prove it right here, right now. Because the proof comes by way of what we call discovery. We exchange documents. And so the fact that Byron Allen was able to get over this major hurdle of not getting his case dismissed. Now he could participate in proving his case. And that means uh, Cam Comcast, that means the other, the other entity now has to give over documents that may help him win his case. Now they have to, now they have to freeze all electronic information concerning this, uh, this lawsuit. Now people can be deposed. And maybe somebody can say something that, uh-oh, leads you to the promised land. And so no big company wants that. Nobody wants anybody else digging through their garbage, going through their room, going throughout their house. They want to keep it private. No company wants that. And so now Byron Allen's looking at everybody saying, hey, we get ready to go into the next phase where I can start looking through your documents and I can start looking through everything that you got to prove my case. And you know what happens. What happens next, Ed? Well, you know, Comcast, they appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, Charter does the same. Um, the Supreme Court decides to hear the case. And what they rule is, is that under this particular statute that, you know, Byron was suing under, that he, the plaintiff, bears the burden of showing that race was a but-for cause of his injury and burden remained constant over the life of the lawsuit. Now, the reason why they said that was because Byron was arguing that all he had to show was that race was a motivating factor for the first part of this lawsuit and that, okay, maybe a but-for standard applies, but that's later on at trial. And the Supreme Court said, hold on, slow down, wait a minute. No, if it's but-for... If it, 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 it's but for throughout the whole thing. Not only do you have to plead enough facts to show that but for your race, you would have gotten the contract, but you also have to show this at, at trial as well, that he must prove a but for causation throughout. And, and you know, 
Byron ESN was arguing that no, there's a, an exception under 1981. And, and he was arguing basically that race was a motivating factor and that at trial when the but for standard applied, that 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 you know that all he has to do is show that it was a motivating standard so he could defeat the motion to dismiss that was put forward by Comcast and you know and, and you know and and, and and charter to a certain degree as well. And so um then, you know, the court kind of looks at the history of these laws and these statutes. It not only looks at that law from 1866, but then it also looks at some changes to Title VII that took the Title VII Civil Rights Act of 1964, and then some amendments that took place in 1991. Now, this gets a little complicated for so for some of us who aren't lawyers, but at the end of the day, well, I don't know how complicated it gets. It looks like a bunch of men or a bunch of Supreme Court jurists finding a way to keep the black man down. So they're grabbing a bunch of statues that fit their rationale to say that you have to show this now. You have to show that race was an issue now. And if I got to show it now, then why are we going to trial? There's no need to go to trial if I got to show it now. From the, from the day that I put pen to paper, if I had the evidence to prove at the time that I put in the paper that motivation was racial, uh, conduct was racially uh, racially induced, then why do I need to go to trial? I proved it up front. There should be no trial. And so even with that standard, you're making lawsuits for those that are in the employment area that are suing on the racial and discriminatory grounds. You're making it harder for them to bring their case. That's why this is important. Now, 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 one of the, now, just, one of the things I, I, I do want to say is, is that this was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court. But one of the things here is that was a little relieving was that um, they didn't change the standard for the Title VII lawsuit. They said, listen, Title VII is Title VII. 42 USC 1981 is a different story, and that that requires a but for standard. Okay, Congress put a motivating a, a motivating factor standard for those Title VII cases, but you know that's that's different, and so that didn't seem to change. Which a lot of observers, legal observers, were a little afraid that this but for standard was going to swallow up that whole arena concerning all of these uh, lawsuits. Now, what I do want to mention is, is that a little earlier, I mentioned the word make versus making. And, you know, th this is a very intricate lawsuit because it talks about not just outcomes, but the contractual process. And I don't know if you ever heard of this woman called the Notorious RBG. Okay. Is she to the Notorious B.I.G.? RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, you know I heard of her. I just want everybody to know that she got a little biggie in her. You yeah, know she has a little biggie. So she says, listen, I agree with most of what my colleagues are saying, but there's one thing that I do not agree with, okay? And I don't agree with Comcast's argument that even if there were some things in the contractual process that my evidence racial animus that only the outcome is what matters here. And she pointed out that very, uh, very clearly in her concurrence. And what is the concurrence? The concurrence means that a judge on the Supreme Court is allowed to agree with their colleague, but write uh, what's called a separate opinion that concurs, but on different legal grounds. Okay, and that's what happened here. And she makes it clear that Comcast shouldn't really get away with making arguments that the contractual process can be discriminatory, but the only thing that matters is the outcome. So, you know, I really invite, you know, not only lawyers, but novices to sit down and read this decision. It's on the internet. You know, it's not that, it's not that long, you know, you, you, it's about, I think about maybe 10 pages. It's a nice bedtime, you know, uh, 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 light read, you know, uh, but, you know, it, the, the, the lawsuit talks about that. Bottom line was, let me get to the, to the end of this. Um, they found that 
Byron had to do a but for cause, and they took the case and they sent it back to the Ninth Circuit. So it's not that it was a complete loss by Byron at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, okay, listen, but for no motivating factor, but for you have to prove that, but for your race, you have to plead enough facts to show that, but for your race, you would have gotten the contract. The Ninth Circuit now has to look at the facts and the complaint through that lens. So we're sending it back to the Ninth Circuit, right? So they also send the charter case back to the Ninth Circuit because they say, Ninth Circuit, we also want you to review that case under those lenses, regardless of charter's arguments concerning the First mm -hmm. Amendment, which they lost at the at the uh, at the uh, at the trial court at the district court. So what ends up happening is is that George uh, Floyd occurs because this this uh, opinion came down on March 23rd, 2020. So things happen, protests occurred. Comcast reaches a settlement with Byron Allen. They they reach a uh, a quote-unquote content carriage arrangement settlement, which meant, means that Comcast has agreed to carry Byron's channel. They redid this, this agreement with respect to, I believe, the Weather Channel, which way they were already carrying on their networks. So that's a win for Byron, right? So yeah. now the charter case is still alive, though. So, so let's let's pause before you get into the charter case because this is I just want to make sure that our audience is following and they know why it's important. So we touched on a few things. This is a black man who is very clearly stating because he's black that he wasn't getting opportunity and access. Why is this important? What if somebody wanted to pick up speaking legally? It's a Byron Allen that would have the opportunity to open up these doors for other shows, other entertainers for us, by us that we as a community can celebrate and be able to participate in this portion of the economy. This is a huge undertaking that he has endeavored. I mean, this takes money to pay his legal staff. This takes time, wear and tear. I don't know what the legal terms are, I'll let you all share that. But this is a lot of emotion, a lot of, of sweat equity. There's a lot going into him staying the course because he could have gotten jumped and broke out. Right, he didn't have to fight back, and, and he made and, a decision to fight back. And keep in mind, on on at the Supreme Court, he was not only fighting Comcast and, and Charter; he was also fighting the government. The uh, U.S. government was siding with Com. This Trump government was siding with Comcast and a uh, Charter on this um uh, in its arguments. So you know, he's not only fighting these private media companies, but he's also fighting his own government. Really sad, but. You know, so far, you know, Byron has been able to settle this case with Comcast. Now he's trying to take the charter communication back to the trial stage because they lost on their First Amendment argument. And hopefully he brings them to their knees. The, the lawsuit against Comcast was a $20 billion, I, I believe, lawsuit. And the one yeah. against Charter, $10 billion. So like you said, Dr. Grant, we're talking about money. We're talking about access. We're talking about access even when we do have the money and we have the goods. Because, you know, it was even when, when you listen to Byron Allen's story about how he even got here from being a stand up comedian to being a media uh, owner. That, that's that's big. A lot of times we don't even get a chance to um, operate or breathe in this arena, you know, because right now this must be highly important because i never seen Ed Pachado put on his uh, Stephen A. Smith voice. Because he got the crazy Stephen A. Smith voice on the legal tip today. And I, rightfully so, because although we're talking about him fighting in the court, what are we really talking about? We're talking about, you know, him picking up the bricks from Bill Cosby and trying to own NBC, right? We're talking about him creating a platform that our stories can be told, as Dr. Grant said, look, we need our narratives. Why do why you think we have uh, speaking speaking legally? Why do you think we have that? So we can take our culture and we can take the legal issues and mesh them together. We need that. And therefore, he was trying to create and is creating a platform. So our narratives, the stories that we find important, what we deem is necessary, what we deem is attractive, or that's programming that we want to see, 
he's creating that. Right now, there's this uh, movie called Pressure that he has on his station. What's the what's the pronunciation of the station? Is it Gyro or Gyro? Rio, 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 right. So, so there's this movie called Pressure that would never seen the light of day if it wasn't for Rio, right? And so Byron Allen is, as you said, he's no longer the corny guy on Canon camera. He's no lo no, no, no longer the invisible guy behind the scenes. He is actually the guy who's in front and actually moving forward in reference to ensuring that our narrative is being told on TV the way it should be. And we have access to every mode of media whatsoever. So this is not small. This is huge. This is big. And even though the courts have decided the but for in 1981 cases, we know as lawyers, Ed, that there's going to be a lot of people that's going to try to use the 1981 analogy and try to apply to 1983. And so we need to be mindful of that. And, and so, and, and keep in mind, uh, uh, Royce, that there was a discussion about the McDonnell Douglas burden of sh burden shifting uh, case as well. And, you know, shifting from the burden of proof to the burden of persuasion. And, you know, so there, there was a lot of that too. So I, I agree completely. And what I'm talking about is, is what happens is a lot of times in these lawsuits, you will allege certain facts and then the burden is then placed on the defendant to then explain a race neutral reason for, for their action. And then after they do that, you then get a chance to respond. So there was some discussion about that in the case. So we're not going to see the last of this case in terms of it being cited on either on, on either side, especially by conservatives who are going to try to wage a war on, you know, civil rights cases. So, you know, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think you said he owns a, what, a, there's a legal a legal station called Justice. What was that station that you called? I believe he has a station called Justice TV as well. And me and yeah, you, I think, I think a, 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 a call, a call, legal yeah, station. Make that call, make yeah. that call right now. Okay, okay. Right now. Uh, yeah, just, I think they need to be just speaking legally. Like, right, you, you know, think we just doing this? Well, we just sitting here, just hanging out. Make the call, y'all. Make the call. Let's get it together. You know what? We are able to have input and impact on the trademark infringement matter in reference to you, Lace and Tim Talley, we can have impact and, you know, we can have the same impact when it comes down to what we want to see, what, how, who we want to see and why we want to see it. So Absolutely. let's put pen to paper. Let's use the social media. You know, I got time. I got a little bit more time in my 24 hours to, to roll up to the studio and do it for Byron. You know what I mean? He's good people. I like the way he's rolling. You got time, Ed? If you got time, I got time. I got time if you got time. <laughs> like you got time? I, I absolutely have time. Right, so I think we're going to send time. this segment out to uh, Brother Allen so he can see what we're about. If anybody has any contacts to him, feel free to let us know so we can get it out there because that's what we're about. And I like Indeed. Yes, Indeed. You tell two <laughs> friends, and I'll tell two friends, and so on and so on. And that's how we do it. Absolutely. Well, let's since we're revisiting Byron Allen, and thank you so much, Ed and uh, Royce, both of you for doing the research on that, because I think we need to know what's going on. A lot of our community spends time viewing TV. We have the data and the stats on that. We need to understand that we should be making money in this industry, not just giving them the money because of our viewership and the kind of resources that we invest in what we see projected on the TV channels. And it's by supporting brothers like Byron Allen who are making it happen. We have, uh, P. Diddy has Revolt, Oprah has Own. You know, until we start getting out and having more access to owning our own, we'll never be able to tell our story properly. So congratulations to him. But there's one more in the news that's kicking up some dust as well. Uh, you know, we started with shout out to the sisters that we're gonna add another piece here where we talk about the follow-up on Miss Monique and her lawsuit against Netflix, we were able to go through that with Mr. Russell explaining that now it can go forward. And I think you had some additional insight on what's happening with this case. Yeah, I let think me, it was. I think before, you go, before you go, let me just uh, let me just kind of subtly let everybody know we're talking about these folks, our folks, our people, and their obstacles and trials and tribulations in court. And hopefully you're learning something from that, that it's okay to stand alone, 
Uh, you never know who joined you. Okay, it's okay to fight for what you think is right. But also, of the many legal things that we that you may learn during this episode, you're really learning about this entity called summary judgment. And that's what we're really talking about here. That's consistent in both of these cases. And what is summary judgment? Summary judgment in the legal field is basically a terminology that is used by lawyers that says, based upon the law, given everything that we know, the lawsuit shouldn't go forward. And so what you saw in the Byron Allen's case, and that's a real simplification of it, what you saw in the Byron Allen's case is that you saw Comcast and the other entity file for a summary judgment motion. I believe it's called uh, 12B or 56A, one of the two. Um, motion to have the case dismissed. Judge, even if we take all the information as is, Brother Allen still doesn't have a case. Well, how does that translate to Monique case? Same thing. She's filing for discriminatory practices based upon her gender, based upon her race, um, st stating that Netflix has intentionally lowballed her as far as compensation, wage discrimination, in that Ellen DeGeneres received millions and millions and millions to do an episode, a comedy special, which she only was receiving $500,000. And also talking about Wanda Sykes, how Wanda Sykes decided that she wasn't even going to play with Netflix because they lowballed her and decided she was going to take her comedy hour and her, her comedy show offline and go through another channel. And so Monique brought this lawsuit and is alleging retaliation, wage discrimination, race discrimination, a little bit of gender discrimination uh, under the guise of being blackballed and not receiving you know, the offers in which she spoke up. And I tell you right now, folks may not think that her voice is important or may think that, look, she's just doing it. She's just blowing a lot of hot air, but that's not true. You can tell that's not true because the courts believe it's not true and the courts did not allow her case to be dismissed. Once again, by summary judgment, the other side, Netflix is saying, she doesn't have a claim. We never heard this before. What do you mean negotiating in bad faith? It doesn't exist. And so therefore her case should be dismissed. And the court said, no, no, no. Is that Matumbo? No, 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 right? Then we got that, slapped it down, said no. She has the right to go forward, and so that's what she's doing, and she's moving forward. Now, no, now Monique is not some, you know, B actor, uh, actress. I mean, we're talking about, you know, comedian, Oscar award winning actress. Everybody remember Precious? All right. She was the one that carried that, right? There was other act actresses that came on the scene, but she was the headline. And Monique don't care whether you are white or black. She's like Lee Daniels. She's like, hey, look, Tyler Perry, uh, Oprah Winfrey, if you lowballing me, we're going to have a problem. So don't do it. Don't even begin. And so her lawsuit is able to go forward um, and it is picking up steam. And when you start to look at others, such as, and I'll read it, uh, uh, the lawsuit cited offers of other comedians, including alleged 70 million deals 70 million dollar deals, 60 million deals, 20 million deals, 16 million deals with Eddie Murphy, Dave Chappelle, Ellen DeGeneres, and Jeffrey Dunham. Right? So now we almost got apples for apples here. White female, black female. At the time that they were making these deals, true, Monique was hot, was hot on the market. And so, you know, when you look at racial discrimination, and you look at wage discrimination, what the court often wants you to have is apples for apples. You can't, you know, use a uh, black female versus uh, a Latino male because the, the defendant is going to make some type of distinction there. But under gender and under wage discrimination, she fit the mold. So kudos to her for being able to go forward. I'm sorry, Ed, because I did cut you off. No, no, listen, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting sick and tired of people telling the sisters that they don't deserve the same amount of money. Like we don't have the same expenses. We don't have the same needs once we don't work as hard as everybody else. I mean, it's amazing. 
Yeah. And especially, especially if you marry the one, right? So we want to yeah. make sure that the money's right on both sides of the table, right? I mean, that's what we do. And, and so, and so we know. And so let's, let's let's be clear that this is not only Netflix's first attempt; this is their second attempt. This is their second strike at a summary judgment motion. Because what do they know? What what they don't want to happen is is they do not want Monique to get to the discovery stage where you have to start exchanging evidence and you have to start opening up your boxes of worms and you have to start, she gets a chance to read some of the emails that might've been sent out and reference to her negotiations. So that's why they're trying time after time to get this case dismissed. And I will tell you often times, once you win a summary judgment motion and you make it past that bigger, biggest hurdle, that's what folks want to come to the table and that's what everybody's talking about. All right, so how are we gonna slice up this turkey? Um, yeah, you want you want a drumstick? All right, you want some leg? Uh, you want it fried? Or you want to make it some? That's when the, that's when you really start to get to the place of movement. And I've seen it personally with Sue and Nike, and uh, and reference to Joe Hammond, and they're illegally using, uh, infringing his name. Once we got past summary judgment and his likeness. Once we got past that, then it was about, okay, how can we resolve this? How can we make it whole? Absolutely. Absolutely right. Well, this is the world that we're living in right now where a lot of what we're seeing is coming to light. It's not new. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've been dealing with disparities. We've been dealing with lack of equal pay. We've been dealing with all these issues for so long. I'm just praying that 2020, that all of what has erupted all of what is happening at the same time will really move us to a different place in 2021 where we're saying all the lives that have been lost all of the unfortunate situations we have witnessed all the trauma we've experienced it was not for naught because there is real transformative change happening in our country and across the world because it's time people are sick and tired of being sick and tired and kudos to all of those who are stepping up and using the legal system to advocate for what is due them. So shout out to both of you for being on the ground each and every day as attorneys in our community, advocating for the rights of those black and brown individuals who have not gotten justice in other forums and are coming to you for your expertise with civil law, with criminal law and immigration. We need to make sure that we empower our communities by sharing information like this show, as well as giving them information about attorneys like Edward Pachada Esquire and Royce Russell Esquire. That's what's needed real time on the ground to help change what we're seeing in the world. So with that being said, yeah. I'm gonna turn it over to you for final comments as we are already almost at the top of the hour. I tell you, our show goes too fast when you're having fun. Now, I do wanna say, I know I've said in the past that hope is eternal, but Unfortunately, there's still individuals who aren't getting the message. Um, I just want to give these two tidbits, and maybe we could talk about this in a future show. But I just want to make the audience aware, for those who aren't, that recently the Louisiana Supreme Court upheld a life sentence for a 62-year-old Black man who stole some hedge clippers from a home 20 years ago. Okay, so this man is doing life. Some edge clipping. Now, control, it was under uh, three strikes out, um, uh, uh, you know, a statute that he got originally convicted under. But damn, you don't do a life sentence for hedge clipping. And, um, and we'll talk about more in terms of who was on that Supreme Court and the dissent coming from the sister who's the chief judge on that court. And then, and then you got a case before the Mississippi Supreme Court that upheld the 12 year sentence for a brother who was caught with a cell phone in jail in 2018. And he was in there on a misdemeanor. So we can talk about that. But clearly, you know, some folks, even with everything that's going on, they're still getting, aren't getting the message. There's just not enough hands to go around that can help one another. Each one, teach one, reach one. There's just not enough hands going around uh, we need more organizations like Until Freedom, Justice Committee, Gathering for Justice, Cop Watch, uh, National Action Network, Youth Huddle Group, 
we need those organizations nationwide uh, to ensure that justice is for everyone. And we need other organizations, the Innocence Projects, to just keep their eye on cases like this um, where we can help someone. Um, we just recently in New York just had the retirement of Judge uh, Shondia Simpson, right? We just had that just the other day ago, and she was renowned for uh, overturning uh, overturning convictions, wrongfully convicted individuals in Brooklyn and in the Bronx. And, you know, I'm sorry that she has to leave the bench, but we need more people like her to uh, seize the moment and make a difference, you know? And that's the end on not being a victim, making a difference. How do we not become victims? We need to make a difference. And so, you know, from my mouth to your ears, um, you know, you read, you need, so you read, or read before you need, you know how we say. So, um, you know, that's it. Uh, you know, thank you for joining another segment of, of uh, Speaking Legally. You know, I'm Royce Russell. I can be reached at 718-785-8890. And I'm so glad that my man Ed Pachato is back overseas <laughs> from the Dominican Republic to the Germanese. <laughs> I mean, that's that's quite a, you know, quite an adventure, brother. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the cookies, brother. Thank you for the cookies. Brother. Thank you. Yeah, right. I just want to say uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to us today. We really appreciate your ear. Um, you know, once again, at Pichardo, um, I can be reached at 718-514-9099. Hablamos español y aquí estamos para servirnos. Byron Allen, Byron Allen, look out for us. And <laughs> barbershop, be on the lookout because here we come. Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't just do a, a end of show shout out to uh, Mr. Royce Russell and Cardiac The Rest and Edward Pichardo for being one of the sponsors for my upcoming conference, which kicks off tomorrow, Faith Penor Weekend. So shout out to all of you, the constituents who bought their action boxes earlier, actually getting an autographed copy of Cardiac Arrest inside their Faith and Or action box. So excited about that. And for those of you that have been watching, Shawnee and Richard, a couple of you have been really loyal here at Speaking Legally. I'm going to give you an offer. If you text your email address over to 347-395-2903, that's 347-395-2903, I will give you a scholarship to attend the conference courtesy of Edward Pachada Esquire, Royce Russell Esquire, and our Speaking Legally family. So those are for faithpreneurs who are faith-based entrepreneurs. If that sounds like you and you're interested, text over your information and we'll get you a scholarship. I just wanted to publicly shout them out for supporting me in the other work that I do in helping to change personal economies for faith-based entrepreneurs. So thank you all for being here and being a part of the show. Be back next week. Same time, same place, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every single Wednesday.